All right. Um, Mark Fiorentino is a self-taught metaphysician who worked as an accomplished troubleshooter for technology companies such as IBM and Harris Government Systems. When he was introduced to Einstein and his idea of the unified field theory at a very early age, he was so impacted by it that he made it his life's work to continue to learn and eventually develop his own research that he calls the theory of everything. Mark answers a question such as, how was the universe created? Is it possible to construct an anti-gravity field? Can we break the light speed barrier? And if so, how? He answers questions like these along with other secrets of the universe, and we are ecstatic to have him on the show. Mark, welcome to Strange Uncles. Thank you for having me. Yeah, um, you know, you are from Florida, I believe, correct? So it looks like your weather's a lot better than our weather. Unfortunately. Uh, yes, it's uh, pretty good over here, 70s and 80s mostly this past week. Very pleasant. Oh. Fantastic. Yeah, we can't compete with that. <laughs> no, well, I miss the cold sometimes. I'd, I'd like to see the snow again. It's beautiful to watch it fall, but not it's nice to, to watch drive it. around in. Yeah, it's nice to watch it fall, and then uh, that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's how long have you been in Florida, Mark? Oh gosh, this has been twenty something years uh, now. Oh wow! Uh, I, I was kind of raised here as a kid, and then moved away for about 16, 17 years. And then I uh, moved back and I've been here for over 20 years now. Wow, that's amazing. I never made that part of the country, to be honest with you. I was in the Navy, but never traveled traveled down down that far. So one of these days, hopefully. But, yeah. uh, you know, and number one, th thanks for taking your time. Much appreciated. I know we got a little bit of a time difference, so thank you for accommodating that. Uh, okay. We've been looking forward to this for a while. And so uh, just so the listeners know, I actually picked up your book, A Master of Reality. Um, this is your latest and greatest. And, and I, I believe your, your only book, correct? You have one in the works, but this is your, your current one out. I had a, a book before this that I've taken off right now, uh, off the market. It's just a fiction book. It's kind of slightly based on, on this idea. Uh, and I thought maybe I should try doing a fiction book to introduce everybody to my ideas. And um, it was mainly written by a ghostwriter and myself. And I just, I'm taking that off. I may put it back on the Amazon at some point, but I'm gonna go down this path. I decided I really need to write the book myself, the whole thing, and put all the ideas and the theory out there. And so I guess that was just like a warm up or a practice. This is the real deal here. And um, so that's, that's where we're at. Yeah. I, um, I'll tell you, honestly, it, it's an amazing read. I'll, I'll be hundred percent honest. I ordered Thank it you. too late folks. Um, <laughs> I actually, I didn't get all the way through the thing. Uh, I got about halfway through uh, for those of you on video, it is master of reality. Uh, fantastic read so far. Um, so, you know, hopefully we're not amiss as far as what you have in the book, but how it's structured, how it's layered out is, is pretty amazing to be honest with you. Um, and I guess we can start there if you're okay with that, Mark, let's kind of, you know, we asked a lot of our, our guests that come on the show, um, you know, kind of how they got to where they're at. So, you know, when you, when you had this whole idea and this, uh, this idea of Einstein's unified theory, I guess we'll start there. And it was presented to you when you, you were young. Um, let's start at that beginning of the road, if you don't mind, and we can kind of, kind of go from there. Sure. Yeah. Um, it, it was just kind of a fluke thing that happened as a result of me going to catechism and the nuns asking, all the kids in the class to go find a saint born on their birthday. And in that time, there was no internet. There was no way to do anything of uh, research that was really in depth and get, you know, find somebody on your birthday that was a saint. So I just asked my parents and then I looked on the calendar and I noticed that Albert Einstein had the same birthday as myself. So I just went to the encyclopedia and started reading about Einstein and I, I guess I made a report on Albert Einstein. I, I don't remember <laughs> what I delivered to them, but I, since there was no saint that I knew of, uh, that's what I, I wound up studying. And I just fell in love with the whole idea. I, uh, as I was reading, I uh, was introduced to the unified field theory uh, in the Encyclopedia Britannica as well. And when I read that, I said, this is the best idea I've ever heard. This makes so much sense. It resonated with me, even though I was 10 years old, it's like I was remembering something that I already knew somehow. 
and I just couldn't quite remember everything. And so then I had this great thirst to go out and, you know, I became very interested in science after that. That became my favorite topic in school. And uh, as the years went by, I would read UFO books, you know, because I was figuring these advanced people would know about the unified field theory and they seem to have some sort of anti-gravity technique going. So I was reading those books to see if I could get information on uh, any clues that were in the books. And there were clues in those books about how um, the UFOs uh, created anti-gravity. So everything I read and, and, and saw on TV, any kind of science shows, any kind of speakers that were talking about the universe, about Einstein and so forth, I just gobbled all that up over the years. And as time went by, I began to get ideas. And, and I started doing what Einstein did. I would do little mind experiments in my head. And I would try to look at the photon and watch it as it traveled through space uh, to look at how particles move. And over the years, you know, these ideas came up. And in the last, I'd say about 10 years before I retired, I started making notes not really thinking about writing a book, but just trying to make sense out of everything. And one by one, the clues linked together to make sense. And then out came the, the theory of super relativity, which basically started in the year 1993, when I, I first wrote a paper about it back then. But it just kind of laid in my head for many years. I played with it over the years and eventually, you know, it became a solid theory and then I, compiled my notes the first day of retirement I started writing the book four years later I finished four years I, I was going to ask if that's how long it took because I know obviously you know your time you've worked for IBM and some of the other companies and so this really kind of came to fruition when you decided to retire you had nothing better to do and, and it kind of came to, in the same basket at that point yeah yeah I was just I just decided I, I, I wanted to have something to do when I retired. <laughs> and I had all these ideas. I was always trying to do inventions and stuff, especially uh, inventions concerning you know perpetual motion because that has great applications for power generation. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that would be something if we ever built UFOs or we were gonna need a very large compact energy source to drive the, the coils and the magnets that I now know for sure is what the UFOs are using. Uh, uh, they're using superconducting magnets to right. create intense magnetic fields. And those are, out of those fields comes the anti-gravity field. Well, and I explain all that in the book. Yeah, I was going to say, if you don't, you know, and this is just because we, maybe it's because we just recently got back from a trip that <laughs> is pretty much, we were telling you off the air a bit, uh, you know, we came back from Area 51. Um, do you mind talking a little bit more about the anti-gravity theory, uh, kind of what the ins and outs of that could possibly be? Yeah, it, it's actually really simple and straightforward. Uh, I got to it by working on the gravity problem. I says, if you want to understand anti-gravity, you first got to understand how gravity works. So I, I really dug into that and that's Einstein's unified field theory, which basically says, electromagnetism and gravity emerge as aspects of a single fundamental field. And, and so I studied, made sure that the fundamental field existed and I found that it did, it's the ether. And uh, so gravity is just a bending of space. It's a certain type of bending. There's several things, ways you can bend a quasi-elastic solid. And one of those ways is to cause it to contract. So gravity is a contraction of space. So what then would be anti-gravity? <laughs> it's gotta be the other way, right? You gotta somehow make space expand. And when right. you do that, you change the, the pressure gradient in, in, in space because gravity is a, is a pressure gradient field as well. You know, it's, it gets more and more intense as you get closer to the origin or the source of gravity. Sure. So anti-gravity is, is um, created by stretching space. And how do you do that? You use a magnetic field. And why does a magnetic field stretch space because we already know, thanks to Michael Faraday and, and so forth, 
that magnetism is really a rotation of space. And so that when moving charges, which are twists of space, they look a lot like, uh, this is gonna be hard to see, but let me just hold it up there. See, hmm. see that? Okay, shape? yeah, yeah. That's a particle. If we could see them, that's what they look like. They're small vortex like shapes. They're spiral shapes. They're twisted around. And so when those particles move through space, space rotates because the particle is a spiral shape. So space rotates around the particle. And when it does that rotation, that creates the magnetic field. And when that happens, this motion, all this twisting motion stretches space. And now hmm. you get as a byproduct of the magnetic field, the anti-gravity field. But it takes a lot of current, a lot of power through the uh, wires to create a really strong magnetic field because that's what you need, like tens or hundreds of Teslas of power to create this magnetic field strong enough to create enough stretching so that you cancel the gravitational contraction field that's below you. So mm -hmm. UFOs do this by you know, lining the bottom of their craft uh, with these strong magnets. And you'll see on a lot of UFO landing sites, you'll notice that there is a clockwise or counterclockwise motion detected, you know, in the, in fields uh -huh. like where there's weed or something. So right. that's an indication that there's a vortex thing going around. And how you do that with a magnetic field is you have many magnets and you're turning them on and off real quick. And so it's spinning around. So you see the bottom of the ship, the magnetic field's turning on and off, on and off, and, and it's doing it really rapidly, like maybe a hundred cycles per second or something. So that's why they hear, some people hear a little low hum when they're near a, a UFO. Right, right. And back when I was reading books about um, UFOs, when I was a teenager and such, uh, one of the, the episodes I read was a UFO, a UF, U.S. Air Force um, colonel or a captain, might have been a captain, he brought to a UFO landing site a magnometer. And as soon as I read that, I said, hey, why? what do you know that everybody else doesn't know? Why did you bring a magnometer to a UFO landing site? Right. Yeah. And, and sure enough, they, they'd make some measurements and they measured a blade of grass and found it to be magnetized. More evidence rolling in if you look through these books, you'll see magnetism keeps popping up and UFO sighting after UFO sighting. Uh, I can go on and on of other people, physicists in some case that were looking at a UFO through uh, polarized lenses, uh, sunglasses, and they saw bands of light coming from the UFO, which is indication that it's polarized and it takes one hell of a strong magnetic field to polarize light, but it can be done. Right. Uh, and Michael Faraday was the first one to actually discover that many, many, that man was a genius, by the way, <laughs> many, many years ago. Well, so and there's loads of information pointing to magnetism is right. what's causing the anti-gravity field. And that, and I would assume that also explains a lot of the, especially some of the older reports of, of cars being disrupted, you know, everything shuts down when they do have these sightings that all comes yeah. hand in hand with what you're discussing. Yeah, uh, having a, a background in electronics helped me learn about how electromagnetism can interfere with cars and radios. You hear about the radio station changing by itself. I used to play experiments with my little AM radio back in the 60s and 70s, put a magnet close to it and I could change the, the station because of the inductive uh, components inside of the uh, radio. And I noticed, hey, hmm, this changes the radio station just like the UFOs do and causes, they sometimes hear a hum or it goes off frequency altogether. And then the, the, the power, the current is interrupted uh, in the car uh, components in the wiring to the engine. All this is interfered with and that takes a magnetic field that's in motion, a static magnetic field, even a really strong one won't mess with stuff as bad as a magnetic field in motion. So mm -hmm. there's another indication that 
they're not only using a magnetic field, but they're either turning it on and off or they're rotating it somehow. So this all really fits together. It makes sense when you connect all these clues together. I am firmly convinced they're using magnetic fields uh, to mm -hmm. get through space to create anti-gravity and it also assists, well, not just assists, it's, it's the way to break the light speed barrier. Yes, actually, and that's actually in our notes on our side, we wanna get in that, I think a little bit later on, but um, you know, you touched on it briefly when you were talking about you know, the military showing up with some of these encounters with the magnometer and, and you know, what they're seeing. Um, I mean, it goes without saying that we're, you, we're assuming that the government has had a hold of this or at least some known collaboration of what this is for, for quite some time, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, probably like most people say back in the late 1940s, mid 40s, somewhere in there when uh, Roswell happened. Uh, they've been collecting these crashed as multiple ones over the years in just this country alone. They may have been able to grab some in some of these other third world countries that uh, the people were not able to really get to it, uh, the crash sites, and they they come in there with they stream in there with the army and the helicopters. They pick up everything and they're out of there before anybody has a chance <laughs> to say anything. Even blink, blink an eye, it's already been yeah. Real. So yeah. they probably by this time captured four, five, six maybe UF crashed UFOs. Uh, they happen. They happen in other parts of the world too. I suspect China maybe has the technology now, mm -hmm. um, but I'm certain the, U uh, the USA has very uh, highly advanced systems now, and they probably also been working with aliens. Have I seen any of this firsthand? No, <laughs> uh, I've not, you know, been working at Area 51 or anything like, this is just from reading just like you guys do and deducing that, yeah, come on, let's, let's just face it. Uh, <laughs> It's There's a lot of UFO sightings, and I do know of one case where a person saw a UFO very close up within touching distance, and they saw the markings on there. And this particular oh. UFO came from here. Oh, wow. United States yeah. Air Force had markings on it. Uh, Interesting. Those people never came forward. You'll not find them anywhere. I was contacted by them directly. And um, Wow. Uh, do, do we have it? Yeah, we do. And, and maybe one of these days, they're going to come forward. I think they're getting close because, you know, the whole thing that happened out in California with the Tic Tacs and everything, it seems like information is starting to slowly leak out of the system. And, yeah, uh, become more mainstream and not so. Uh, so maybe we're getting to the point where they're going to finally make an announcement at some point. I, I hope so, because... It would be a great benefit to mankind to have this technology. Absolutely. Yeah, it would. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, yeah, it, it's a sad thing that, uh, you know, how they, I guess, spoon feed is, is the word. Um, but anyway, you know, we, we don't want to take the whole time on UFOs, but I, I caught that right off the very beginning of the book because of, of how you kind of painted that picture. Um, so I appreciate the, the, you know, elaboration on that for sure. Um, there's one other thing that I had a question on. Uh, and it's something that you have, it's a theory you have on slip wave. And I'd like to, you know, let's see if you can't kind of elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, the, the slip wave, I actually have a drawing over here. I don't know if I could share this with you or not. Where is that drawing? There it is. Um, can I share the screen for a second? Um, I don't, I I don't know, to be honest with you. Let me, um, let me yeah, see you just need to give him permission. Yeah. Yeah, it's disabled right now. Let's see if that changes on your side. So I do have it marked a multiple participants. So you should be able to. Did it change on your side, Mark? Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's let me do it. Here we go. Right. And here we share. Right. And uh, you can look at this for a second. There you go. There's a slip away for you. There we go. Oh, wow. It's a, it, it's a density vortex. Remember that shape I showed you, the shell? Yeah. Right here you see it again. So you have the point right here. This is where the rotation of space starts. 
electrical charge, the Coulomb force charge is a rotation of space. This is what it looks like. So this is basically an electron. So as it begins to rotate, it goes through more and more degrees until you get to 90 degrees and then 180 degrees and it's back on the x-axis again. Uh, so what we see when we use uh, experiments in the lab, we see a spherical shape for the electron, mm -hmm. but that's really because we're not seeing this particular dimension, which is what I'm showing you is the, the gravitational type of the anti-gravitational effects that are going on. Because there's, um, as we wind this rotation, space becomes thinner and thinner. The more you wind it, the more it stretches. So the pressure drops. So across this plane here, this line, this x-axis, I'll call it, uh, from here, you've got normal pressure. When you get to the rear end, it's very low pressure. So the pressure from the outside of space that's not bent or in any particular way is pushing in, pushing in like this. Oh. So that whole thing is going to be directed where the green arrow is in that direction. So, it, so the slip wave is just a rotation of space that goes around and as it winds more and more around, space becomes thinner, less dense, the pressure drops. And this creates a pressure gradient within the particle. And that's the cause of particle motion. So what we do, or what I decided to do is to emulate that to build a spacecraft. I says, this works for the particles. All particles move like this. If you can imagine a bubble in water, it goes up because of the pressure gradient. There's a pressure gradient in the ocean itself. It's, it's much stronger at the bottom of the ocean and less as you go up. So the bubble is a very low pressure, very low density compared to the water. It's literally pushed up from the bottom and rises to the surface. This is a very similar phenomena that I'm showing you right here. It's literally pushed up in the direction of its uh, conical shape there hmm. uh, from the back end forward. And so this describes how particles move. And at the same time, I say, hey, we could use this same concept, this same design to create um, spacecraft. All we have to do is make a uh, gradient field that exists within the ship and you use the magnetic fields in ever increasing. See how I see these, these little yellow rings here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Imagine each one of those, let's say you had a, a spaceship that was shaped like a cigar shape. And Lord knows we've seen a lot of those in the skies over oh, the yeah. years. Well, you put a ring here and you turn a magnetic field on air, really strong one. Then the next ring you turn on and this one, the magnetic field is even stronger. Then you go to the next magnetic field ring and you turn that even harder. And then the final one here is turned on really hard. What you do is you create a pressure gradient across that x-axis again. And now that whole spaceship moves within the slip wave bubble and, and bends space outward uh, with the biggest bending outward at the rear of the ship. So that thing is gonna be pushed forward Exactly. Okay. And that's how the slip wave works. Now, oh, <laughs> now I can get back to uh, unsharing this screen here. You're fine. And why, so why we got you, just this little caveat for a listener. So regular listeners, unfortunately, you probably won't be able to see it. But if you are a Patreon member, uh, we will, we are recording this. So we'll probably have this a link for, so you can see this in video because it is pretty amazing. Um, how long did it actually take you to, to formulate this question one? And part two of the question would be, how come this isn't talked about? How can, I mean, really, if you look at the basis of it, it's not that hard to understand. So right. why are we in the situation we're in currently? With technology? Well, that's a, a multi-headed uh, problem there. As <laughs> I see, when I think of this, I think of like a, a multi-dragon head. Uh, you've got the physicists basically who have been led down the quantum mechanics road. Well, the quantum mechanics road, you know, they don't really like to talk about an objective reality, a real physical objective reality. They don't believe in the ether. 
they don't believe in, you know, um, the quasi elastic solid that is space in actuality. Uh, so they're not going to think there and they're not going to go there. And if you, you talk to a lot of them, they get angry. So these guys normally are not going to go down that road of thinking about it like Einstein was. He never gave up on differential equations and, and the bending of space. Well, you can't bend something that's not there. No. And since most people nowadays think that space is a completely empty void made of nothing, um, they just don't pursue this, hmm. this um, old classical physics uh, technique that I use in my book. And I'm working on the mathematical model right now and programming it into the computer. So I have to teach myself how to program and then put it in because I need I I know what exactly needs to happen. So rather than to try to explain it to a programmer, I just do it myself. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and um, Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. So I'm almost done with that, but I'm going to need that kind of firepower to back this up because uh, I need to get this to scientists at some point. And, and I do have some lined up a very open-minded fellow I met at an anti-gravity conference. Awesome. And uh, real great guy. So I'm looking forward to wrapping up the math here because I'm going to do something that's never been done before. Mm. Uh, I have a mathematical model using fairly simple equations. It's a set of equations, but I'm going to be able to predict the particle mass of the proton and the neutron. That's never been done before. Wow. And I'm going to prove it and do it in such a way, I'm not even gonna use, um, what are they called? Um, <sighs> tuning parameters. What are tuning parameters? Well, even Einstein and Newton used tuning parameters for gravity, like the gravitational constant. Well, where did that come from? You know what? Nobody knows. <laughs> it's, it's some sort of hidden physics. You know, they derived it, though they didn't derive it, They they empirically made some measurements and say, oh, the gravitational constant of this thing is we measured it, you know, and it's between here and here. We'll just pick the number in the middle and that's gravitational constant. They use that to get the, the equations correct and it works, but we don't know why. And like that same theory. constant is used in Einstein's um, general relativity mm -hmm. theory and those equations. So, he just described that bending, how mass can be used to bend that space accurately uh, showing the deformation of space. So he knew there was still an ether and he even talked about it in his in, in speeches and such. Right. Uh, so. Exciting. No, it's, yeah, I, yeah, it, I, it's that's amazing. It, yeah. Yeah. So I, I need to do that kind of work right now. That's what I'm focusing on is, is getting the science stuff out there backed up using their own formulas that they've had access to for over three and a half centuries <laughs> and never properly interpreted those formulas. I say these, what is math? Math is basically uh, a language for describing reality. Right. Uh, you right. know, unfortunately nowadays it's become so abstracted, it really doesn't make sense anymore. And if you talk to quantum mechanics guys and you ask them to interpret their theory, you'll get dozens of different explanations, you know, how the reality works. Well, there's multiple particles all duplicated, all going in different paths all at the same time. And then there, no particle has a pro property such as speed or, or location. And, and none of that makes any sense. So right. what I'm doing is dragging them back over the finish line telling them actually science does make sense. And so and this is why, yeah. And I'm going to prove it. And um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Yeah. That's, that's actually phenomenal. Mark, we're going to take a quick break. Um, if you just want to stay tuned with us, we will come right back. Listeners stand by. All right. And we are back uh, with Mark Fiorentino and we were talking about, so here's on my side, and, and again, John, Josh, everything to add by all means, but I am fascinated with quantum physics. I always have been because it's such this weird, it's a mysticism of science that nobody seems to understand. And I've tried to wrap my head around it, but I've got Montana education behind me. So that hasn't been successful. However, you mentioned that in your book about quantum 
physics and you have a stance on it and you talked about it a little bit before the break. Do you, can you talk about that a little bit more about quantum physics and just why well, that's not I, really maybe where we need to be searching? Well, how we got into this whole subject, which I, I don't know that I ever fully, fully answered your question. I answered half of it. That's one reason why people haven't discovered this stuff. The other reason is the United States government is keeping it quiet. Why are they keeping it quiet? The main reason they keep it quiet, it gives them a strategic military advantage. So that's the other reason to, to finish up answering your other question. It's not in their best interest of the United States government to tell everybody we got anti-gravity machines and we have UFOs of our own, because let's face it, those machines can fly circles around the best aircraft and missiles we have. Yeah. Uh, and to an they don't that, want to lose that advantage. I don't think any government wants that, let alone the United States. That's right. just government in general. Right? So, you know, that's, that's, that's why that is. Now, getting back to your other question, let's go over that. What was that? I kind of got off track here. And I got it. Oh, you're fine. Um, just wanted to kind of recap the idea of quantum physics with you. You know, uh, you, you mentioned that in your book a bit. Um, I, did, I just want you to mention that to listeners because I found it kind of fascinating. Yeah, it, it's the battle started between Einstein and, and Niels Bohr back in the 1920s, I guess it started maybe there back in that time. And, you know, Bohr and Heisenberg and, and those guys, they, they were all just thrilled about quantum mechanics because they seemed to be getting right answers for particular types of experiments, you know, having to do with particles. Because let's face it, probabilities, which is what quantum mechanics is built upon entirely, <laughs> and, and statistics, uh, this works good for figuring out, you know, the average particle interaction. If you, you know, use an accelerator and you smack something a million times, you know what, that, that math will give you the, the spread <laughs> and the layout, the bell curve or whatever that gives you a very precise predictions on how many of these things events you're going to have, how many of these, what kind of particles you can make by doing this mm -hmm. works really great. And, and somehow that turned into a reality for scientists and physics. Uh, okay. As it, you know, it just became like a religion to them. Right. And, and they never really heard. don't like a lot of them. The more successful ones have an open mind or whatever, but there's a lot of guys that I've encountered, not a lot, you know, a few that got really mad when you, when you challenge quantum uh, physics. I mean, I, I've been banished from certain places because <laughs> I dared to question it. And it's funny how close-minded scientists can actually be. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And this guy's a regular physicist. He won't let me answer questions on Qora anymore. He, he minimizes my answers right away within seconds. Amazing. And, you know, I didn't say anything mean to him. I just said, I thanked him for his answer and his answer helped me with something that I had a question about. But what he didn't like was he was kidding with his answer, but it was true. And it made physicists look bad. And the more I liked it, the angrier it got to the point where he just wouldn't talk to me anymore. Hmm. So it's a problem and we're holding ourselves back and I call it basically an intellectual uh, ignorance, a deliberate attempt not to know something because you just don't want to believe it's true. Yeah, it baffles me, that just good. baffles me. And how many years is that going to set us back, you know? In, oh yeah. Well, 200 years you know we may get there but we could have got there 20 years prior we, like, have solved, we should have solved the gravity problem in around 1970 somewhere in that decade mm -hmm. and uh, einstein didn't solve it because he didn't know about the quarks and if he had known about the quarks he knew he knew the secret to gravity and he even um i i have a passage here and i read it on a lot of the shows he discovered, he calls it his happiest thought. He discovered what the real mechanical cause of gravity was. Before this, this idea came about, really nobody knew. And it goes like this, it's from Amir DXL's book, God's Equation. Einstein, this is his happiest thought. 
Einstein followed the line of reasoning that began with the happiest thought of his life. Still at the Swiss patent office, he conducted one of his famous thought experiments. Einstein imagined a circle spinning in space. The center of the circle did not move, but its circumference was moving quickly in a circular direction. Einstein compared what happens in several reference frames, a standard tool he had used in developing the special relativity theory. And here's the important part. He concluded using his special relativity that the boundary of the disk contracted as it spun. There was a force acting on the circle at the boundary, the centrifugal force, and its action was an analogous to that of the gravitational force. But the same contraction that affected the outer circle left the diameter unchanged. Thus Einstein concluded in a way that surprised even him, the ratio of the circle to the diameter was no longer pi. This means that space is bending, it's contracting. He says it right there. And then he knew that he needed to look for a geometry because a, a dynamical geometry, and I found that geometry through a, a lady who had a near death experience. There it is. It's this. Oh. This is what's going on inside of the neutron and proton. This is called a trefoil hmm. knot. It's a three-dimensional object. There's three quarks in there. They're moving, and I calculated this the other day, 99995 percent the speed of light. They're moving at that speed, and they're moving in an accelerated pattern because it's a circular motion. Acceleration, Einstein determined, is the same thing as gravity. I'm linking all this for you. I'm showing you that he says... This accelerated motion, the spinning disk, is a, it's a circular motion. It's accelerated. He said acceleration is the same thing as gravity. So I'm, I'm making the final link. This acceleration causes gravity because when it does this, any particle, any spinning disk, whatever, it increases in mass. That's how mass is made. Mass doesn't happen if there isn't something moving. All Mass, gravity, inertia all come about as a result of inertial mass increase, motion, particles in motion, and an accelerated unbalanced charges in accelerated motion cause space to contract. It's just that simple. That's gravity. I'll be damned. Huh. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know what to say about that. I think you're the smartest person I've ever talked to in my life. <laughs> it, it is pretty well, it took me, you know. It took me decades oh to figure it out. But I kept listening to Einstein. I kept reading about, I always looked for these mind experiments and these interpretations because that's how you model mathematics that'll work. Mm -hmm. You have to have a working mechanical model that you work from to derive your equations. So I kept reading and looking for these clues and I linked, I just linked them together over the years and, you know, I started having my happiest thoughts. The slip wave was my happiest thought. I yeah. got that at work looking at this chart here. I used to sit between jobs, you know, fixing computers. And I'd look at this chart here and I'd say, why do all these particles have mass in the standard model, but the photon? Huh. Photon is made of the same stuff as all the other particles. It's an electromagnetic field. They're all electromagnetic fields. Yet all the other particles have some sort of mass except the photon. Then I said, well, ask some questions, Mark. Well, what is it doing different than the other particles? And sure enough, it is doing something different. It travels in a straight line at a constant rate of speed, the speed of light. Mm -hmm. It doesn't accelerate. And I had my happiest thought. I said, my God, this confirms it. God left us a clue, the photon. It moves through space in a straight line at a constant rate of speed. Therefore, there's no contraction around in and around that particular particle. So it has zero mass. All the other particles have angular momentum, all of them. They're, you know, electrons, quarks. Except for anything that's out there is, is unbalanced charge. And unbalanced charges don't travel straight through space. They do this orbital thing and that's acceleration and that makes mass. So that was my happiest thought. I said, I got it. I know what, what for sure makes mass now and what doesn't. 
It's mo particles in motion and it's motion through the ether. It causes the space to contract and bend around the particles. Everyone but the photon. That's amazing. That absolutely is amazing. Um, let's, and I'm sure that this is going to lead us to the same, what we've been talking about. Time travel, Mark. When we think about that, we think, well, obviously, you know, that's something that, that you know, everybody, it's been a, uh, something that's been talked about for centuries almost. Um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, time travel. Uh, I write about it. I write about time in one part of the book. I explain why we have time here in a physical dimension and why we don't have time in the hereafter, you know, heaven. Uh, I don't know if you guys believe in that or not, but I can tell you it's real. It's true. <laughs> there is a God. So over there, the many, many thousands, millions of people that I have had near-death experiences say, hey, you know, there's no time over there. It's outside of time. Oh. And, and we've definitely heard good. that before. Yeah. Yeah. And, but here we definitely have something that appears to be time. <laughs> and I says, well, in order to have time, you, you've got to really have, and I'll get to time travel, but I want to explain how time works oh, here. Sure. For, yeah. yeah, for sure. Please. In order to, to have the, uh, what's the word, the, the illusion of time <laughs> You have in the physical realm, any physical realm, you have to have a material substance to traverse. In other words, space has to be made of something real. Right. You can't travel from point A to point B in space. If there's nothing in between. If it's really nothing, how much time does it take to get from point A to point B? Distance equals rate times time. If I don't have any real distance between these two points, it takes zero time to get from here to here. Why? Because there's nothing there to travel across. How do you? We never see that happen. Hmm. We see that, that a light beam takes time to travel through space because yeah. there's really, there's something there. There's a medium there. And it takes a finite amount of time because the speed of light itself is moving at a finite number. It's not infinite. So if it were infinitely fast, uh, the only way it could do that is there would be nothing there. And then any rate would be infinitely fast, but that we don't have that. So we have time. Time emerges as a result of space being real. No space that's no real, no time. And, and if you have infinite speed, then you have no time. So we, we can't have those two things here until later how I discovered things, how to beat the system. And, and, and it gets a little bit complicated, but the system can be beat. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can go infinitely fast using the slip wave, uh, but that still doesn't really affect time for other people or even time for you because time becomes absolute now. Mm -hmm. If it takes you, if you're going at nearly infinite, let's just say you're going 50,000 times the speed of light and you go to the next star, which will take you maybe 15 or 20 minutes to get there. It takes you 15 or 20 minutes in your time and the same time on earth. Uh, forget all the Lorenz transformations because they all get bent out of shape because the math changes because of the slip wave. Mm -hmm. uh, special relativity has to be extended now, there, now we got to do work to extend special and general relativity to accommodate the changes in space but space is really no longer absolute einstein proved that with general relativity you can bend it you can concentrate it it's not absolute it can be changed so i'm just changing it in the other direction so when this happens time changes let me put it to you another way. <laughs> Let's just say we're in space. We have two points, A and B. Uh -huh. And we have a perfectly smooth field of gravity here. Uh, or no gravity. It, you'll get a constant rate of motion. But let's say we put a gravitational field on this, this end here. Strongest here, weakest here. And then we shoot a light beam through that. That light beam will slow down. We know that's a... That's a scientific fact. Mm -hmm. Light slows down in a gravitational field, but does it really? All that's really happened is there's more stuff because of the contraction of space. It's compressing space. 
and it's going through more space, but it looks like the same distance, but there's more stuff in here now. So that when that beam shoots through there, it takes longer to get through. More proof, more evidence that space is a real physical object. So, so kind of like how light and sound travel slower through water than they do through air, right? Exactly. Okay. More evidence. The denser the medium, the slower light travels. Wow. I'm not saying anything that we already don't know. Right. We know this stuff. <laughs> we just fail to interpret it properly. Right. Well, so now that's time. Okay. That's why we have time in the physical realm. But you wanted to go back in time, then you got to use the Stargate, which I kind of heard about through the grapevine. So I wrote a chapter on it. In my second book, I'll give you the details about how I heard about it. Mm. <laughs> and it's astonishing. Wow. But I was given some clues and I researched those clues. And sure enough, uh, I found a technology that could be used to build a Stargate. And if you really? have this technology, and at the very first part, you'll get to this chapter. It's the second to the last chapter. When you get there, the very first thing I say at the beginning of the chapter, if you want to build a time machine or a machine that you can travel through other dimensions and, or other great distances, you're going to have to make something that moves faster than the speed of light. Some particle mm -hmm. is going to have to be accelerated beyond the speed of light because you use that to tune space so let's say you have a framework, uh, the Stargate framework. So emitting, being emitted from that inward, uh, there's going to be, let's say they use light particles, photons. The material in the Stargate is composed of something that I now believe is what they're using that the United States probably already has this technology too. I believe they're using something called fractal lenses. What's a fractal lens? A fractal lens is made of a metamaterial. What's a metamaterial? Metamaterial is, if you go on to ResearchGate, it's been discovered and invented. It's a material that changes the permittivity and permeability within a particular solids or whatever that they use, they make. It's a pattern that they assemble to change the permittivity and permeability of space. Why does that matter? Well, the speed of light was determined by James Clerk Maxwell is determined by permeability and permittivity by this equation, C equals, the speed of light equals one over the square root of permeability times permittivity. So Maxwell figured it out eons ago why the speed of light is the number it is. So and again, permeability and permittivity are tuning parameters that they kind of just discovered by making measurements what they were in free space. And so he then did the math. If that's the case, then this is like light traveling through space is like sound waves in a way. And, you know, he used the same technique that they determined sound waves and he used it to determine the speed of light. And sure enough, it worked. Right. And um, so... Mm. This material, this metamaterial, also called left-handed material, I don't know why they call it that, but um, <laughs> can be used to accelerate photons. They come out of this thing. Now they hit regular space and they cause a shock wave when they do that. And it tunes, it compresses to the point there's a vibration that's ultra high frequency. And that's how they tune the space in order and the physics that goes beyond that, I, I still don't understand. I would need some really smart physicists working with me and saying, how does this exactly create, you know, these openings? Because if you want to time travel, let's say go back in time, God help us, that's a bad idea, but I'm <laughs> sure they're doing it. Um, if you want to go back in time, then you got to really hit the space hard with, with this um, force beam, or it's not really a beam, it's a wave. It's coming out and then maybe you, you enhance that by oscillating the air with the high frequency sound so you got a combination there that creates a resonant frequency and what you do is you create a portal opening you don't actually you know like in the old movie where the guy sits in the time machine and everything's going backwards <laughs> right right it doesn't happen why because time is all happening all of time is happening at the same moment this is the only way a time machine could actually work. If you want to get to another time, 
then all you got to do is open a portal from this time to another time segment, either forward or backward in time. So it's doable if you have this technology. And of course, that's my most highly speculative chapter. But I would love to work with the guys that are working with that because it would be cool because you should be able to tune this system like a radio to, to any frequency that you desire so that you can go forward or backward in time. And you just walk through this thing like you walk through a door. Yeah. And you I walk right you into say. another dimension or another time. It'd be really cool. Freak, you need a massive amount of funding and a team of <laughs> scientists to help you with this. Yeah, and people with open mind. That's I think that's yeah. that most. Uh, that's what I need. People well, with open the, mind. the open mind is key for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really, really want to work on the anti-gravity. I want in my book, in the later chapters, I talk about the supercar, and I really want that to be something everybody has. And I talk about the things you can do. Not, not only is it convenient and wonderful for people to be able to go to other parts in the world in a matter of a few short minutes. I could go from Florida to Tahiti in five or 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to be moving at 50 or 60,000 miles per hour. And, you know, that's pretty tricky. Uh, because uh, you don't want to hit anything going at that speed. So you got to develop a whole worldwide network or satellites, positioning, global positioning, you know, and you got to uh, how your course like a person does with an airplane. You just can't woo woo taking off and you got millions of people doing that. They're going to hit each other eventually. Uh, so I would like to create this technology so that it keeps humanity safe because the earth isn't going to go on forever at some point sooner or later either there's going to be a meteor or a really big super volcano or something worse that happens that's going to make this planet unhabitable and we need to be able to get off this planet we need to have people on other worlds already just in case and we need to be able you know like the noah's ark kind of thing Mm -hmm. Get the heck out if something bad's going to happen. Or at least we could use the technology to put up drones that push away any incoming meteors or comets or whatever. Mm -hmm. As long as we do not have this technology, we're not safe. We could be wiped out at any time. Right, right. Well, ask the dinosaurs. <laughs> I will say, you know, I'm not really so much worried about natural disasters and yeah you're absolutely right we're this ball of rock spinning in space um but we're not doing a too shabby of a time on our own trying to bring this world to an end too. you know it's kind of yeah yeah kind of a shame yeah. you know so either way you look at it you know right um absolutely amazing mark i i you know we'll run a little bit of time but we want to give you first of all for the listeners again his book uh master reality um Despite this whole episode, you, you've been fantastic explaining, laying things out. The one thing you do specify in the book, and, and I really love anybody to pick it up because you do a very, very good job Thanks. laying it down in layman terms. Right. Very easy to read, very easy. Look, this is what I think of. This is what I came up with. And this is why. And you explain it in different ways for any kind of anybody who might be interested in this on any level. And I, I just, I really appreciate that because that takes work as a writer to do that. It takes a lot of patience, you know, for you to think, get out of maybe what you think and your calculations and your thoughts and how you hear things and put it into terminology that maybe, you know, your average show such as us would, uh, would pick up on. So, you know, kudos I, for you on that. I rewrote each chapter at least 10 times. I, I can imagine. I absolutely can imagine. Um, do you have anything to promote, anything on your side that we can help you with at all? Uh, yeah. Any um, parting I, wisdom? I, well, I, I could tell you one thing we didn't touch on. I think it's really cool and interesting that's in the book is that I also made a discovery concerning the sun. Uh, when you get to the last chapter in the book the, or the last set of chapters, it's cosmology chapters. They're right before the last chapter. And um, there's three chapters in cosmology. And I talk about the beginning of the universal cycle and the end. And I reworked it so that the Big Bang actually makes sense now. And it really all center, centers around the neutron and uh, realizing that the giant cosmic aid is really 
egg is really just a neutronium seed or a giant, uh, black holes are made of neutronium, which is basically solid neutrons uh, compacted to a tremendous level. And they're built and designed just to be able to do that. Neutrons can do that, protons can't. So they can't be compacted like that. And what I discovered is that when the Big Bang happened uh, and the neutronium burst back out, there wasn't just a lot of neutronium gas, but there was neutronium spheres of all sizes. Some as black hole size, some smaller, as small as maybe um, a basketball or something. And all these spinning spheres formed, uh, were the seeds that formed uh, the stars and the planets. So I'm saying that the sun, all stars have neutronium cores and whatever. And if you doubt that, just look at one when it blows up, what's left? Always either a neutronium core or a black hole, which is made of neutronium in my book, my uh, personal Interesting. opinion. Interesting. Um, the, the explosion didn't make the neutronium or the neutron star. It was already there. What it did is it became unstable and it blew off its atmosphere. The reason you get an atmosphere that doesn't fall into the neutronium is because it's spinning rapidly. And when that happens, you get frame dragging. And so the gases orbit and don't ever really fall into the neutronium core. And so they become thicker and thicker and more and more pressurized and that starts the fusion process. So I am certain. And if you look at NASA's measurements, they clearly say there's something solid inside the sun. It's just a matter of interpreting it and accepting that uh, that's true. And I go over that in the book and I say, hey, the sun is all stars. The galaxy centers are giant black holes made of neutrons. And these all came out at, at the time of the Big Bang. And without this, it would have never happened. And why is it neutrons? Because there's something special that made me suspicious about neutrons. They're different than the proton. The proton, you can isolate it in outer space and it never decays. It goes, it lives for billions of years. But if you isolate a neutron within 15 minutes, it turns into a proton and electron. Mm. And what's that? That's hydrogen. And what do you need to build stars? Lots of hydrogen. So the fuel that came out was naturally made to turn into hydrogen, all the, the neutronium gas. So that's the message I want to I want to give to the world. I, I I worked it out, and and the stars, all stars are created this way, you know, and it explains the gap that's in astrophysics right now. So they never could figure out why the gases. The repulsive force of the uh, proton and the electron is orders of magnitude stronger than the gravitational pull. They should never form dense clouds and start a fusion process. Something had to pull that gas together and pressurize it. And that's the only reasonable explanation that I could come up with. And it was, to me, it makes sense. Uh, their explanation, they know doesn't really make sense, but that's kind of a cool thing that's in the book that I'd like to get out there because I think they could do some experiments to determine this for sure. Well, there's a lot of cool things in the book besides that. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. You know, it's a great read. Um, I'm definitely going to finish it from what I say. So again, uh, Mark uh, Fiorentino, thank you so much for coming on. Master Reality is your book. Uh, you have a website here, if anybody wants to check it out, at www.super-relativity.com. Uh, and I think we can follow you on Twitter, too, at MarcoF7704. Is that correct? Yeah, I never use it, but one of these days, I, <laughs> well, I figure I might use it someday. I, yeah. I don't even know how it works, really. I've got to study it and see if it's something I could use. But Neither do we. So, you know, it's what it is. But anyway, it has been amazing having you on. I mean, honestly, it, it's it's kind of, I've got to, I feel personally, I've got to process a lot of what we do. Well, we mm -hmm. just to make sense out of it. Yeah, I'm going to uh, have to listen back to this a couple times. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. It was amazing, though. So, 
Thank you. It's a privilege to talk to you. So thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for your time for sure. Mark. And if you want to just hang online with us after we get in recording and uh, we'll do a quick thank you to you and uh, we'll go from yeah. there. Gentlemen, that was Mark Fiorentino. Thank you, sir.